colleagues uh, worldwide who are joining us today in large numbers for this uh, special event during the High Level Political Forum on behalf of the United Nations and the United Nations Development Programme. I warmly welcome you to this very interesting and very important event focusing on poverty and also the multidimensional poverty index. Colleagues, how much the world has changed in just a few months. A year ago, at the end of uh, at the 2019 launch of the multidimensional poverty index, we were all discussing and noting uh, that at least 270 million people had been lifted out of multidimensional poverty over the course of a decade. Yet COVID-19 has changed everything, with its triple hit on health, education and income, and so many other aspects in people's lives, it threatens to reverse overall global human development, perhaps for the first time since the UNDP started calculating it through the Human Development Index. It is also propelling millions back into multidimensional poverty. There are many ways to define and measure poverty. Income-based measures such as the $1.90 a day can be a useful way to do it, but they fall very far short in telling the whole story of poverty. Who of us who are participating today in this live event could even contemplate surviving on such an amount? The pandemic is a stark reminder that we need to look beyond income poverty when thinking about development. We cannot assume that if we fix the income problem, then everything else will be fine. All statistics offer a glimpse into the past, the world as it appears in the rearview mirror. The data in the report presented today was collected before COVID struck, and it showed continued progress in poverty reduction. But now, of course, that seems very unlikely. We need instead to work on tackling poverty and vulnerability to poverty in all its forms. This is why the multidimensional poverty index is so important. The index, which applies 10 different lenses to understand how people experience poverty, helps us figure out where to apply pressure to do the greatest good for the greatest number. On where we can act now to both tackle the most severe impacts of the crisis and what can be done to better prepare countries and communities for the next one. And let us be clear, there will be more crises, particularly in the face of our ever more unstable climate. The MPI asks, for example, whether a person is undernourished or has enough good food to eat, how many years they attended school, what kind of fuel they cook meals with, whether their toilet is clean and safe, how long they have to walk, if at all, to get clean water to drink, or what they use to make the walls of their homes. In other words, the index asks whether every person has the ingredients they need to live a dignified life. The MPI does not present answers, but it does allow us to ask the right questions. It presents us the kind of tailored and disaggregated data that is needed to reach the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, goals that offer a clear pathway to ending poverty in all its forms in our lifetime. These data can also help inform successful strategies to recover from COVID-19. The current pandemic, offers an opportunity for every country to rethink development and to build forward better. That will require fresh ideas, greater honesty, and also reflection on the choices we have made in the past, choices that have locked too many people still into extreme poverty and with little prospect of escaping it. And they will require novel data. The multidimensional poverty index in which UNDP and OFI have been such close partners provides exactly that opportunity. So with these opening remarks, it is my pleasure to now turn to Sabina Alkiri, who is the director of OFI and very much at the center of providing us with these annual insights into what uh, the Multidimensional Poverty Index provides us. So Sabina, to you and uh, to you to address us on what we can learn from the progress achieved on the reduction of multidimensional poverty and what does it also tell us in terms of how we emerge from this crisis. Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Achim, and thank you to all of you who have joined and given your time and to the distinguished panelists uh, for your reflections. 
and also to the teams of HDRO, UNDP, and OFI for your fierce, persistent, and excellent work that underlies the 2020 Global Multidimensional Poverty Index report we launched today. This report is momentous, um, and yet uh, I can only skim the surface in a few minutes. So I'll define the MPI. I'll say something about the 2020 uh, MPI resu results, something about trends and COVID. But there are many more aspects about SDGs related to higher education or immunization or work and employment or climate change that are in the report and I urge you to consider. As Achim said, the global MPI takes SDGs indicators related to SDGs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 11. And for each person, it develops a profile of which of those 10 deprivations they carry. What is their deprivation load? And if they're deprived in one third or more, they're multidimensionally poor. And this becomes a measure together with the incidence and intensity of poverty we can disaggregate by rural urban areas, age, or subnational regions. So what do we find with the global MPI, which this year covers 107 countries and 5.9 billion people, with updated results for 25 countries and 913 million people? We find that 1.3 billion are multidimensionally poor. And who are they? Half of them are children, two thirds live in middle income countries, 85% wake up in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, 85% live in rural areas. And when we say multidimensional, we mean multidimensional. Of those 1.3 billion people, 99% carry three or more deprivations, and over 80% carry five or more at the same time. So how has this level of acute multidimensional poverty changed? To do this, we release a study now for 75 countries with strictly harmonized indicator definitions for two periods of time. And those 75 countries cover 5 billion people. The fastest reduction in absolute terms came in Sierra Leone, Mauritania, and Liberia. In relative terms, getting on the distance to zero poverty, North Macedonia was the leader followed by China and Armenia. In terms of the number of poor, as Achim said, in 10 years, India reduced its poverty by 270 million people. Uh, China in four years by 70 million, Bangladesh, by 19 million in five years. But how did change occur? At the top of this graphic, we see Sierra Leone, Mauritania, and Liberia and the 10 MPI indicators. And we see that each had a different pattern of reduction, although significant reductions in all 10 indicators. So there are many path pathways to success. It's only necessary to find one. There are different pressure points and different ways of reducing. So let me give you an example of how we go within the countries using Bangladesh, um, which reduced the incidence of its MPI from 38 to 24% in five years. And it did so in a pro-poor way. Silhet was the poorest region in Bangladesh and it reduced poverty the fastest. So it's catching up, it's not being left behind. Children were the poorest and they made the fastest progress. And Bangladesh was one of 20 countries that reduced all 10 of its MPI indicators to achieve this. So every country has its own story and we can only touch the surface, but it's important to understand. Where do those trends take us? For example, will we be able to have the MPI globally in developing countries between 2015 and 2030. To explore that question, we projected with three models, linear, constant, relative, and logistic. And we found that 47 countries would be on track to cut poverty um, before COVID and 18 
sadly, we're not on track by any model. And those 18 are also the poorest. And so there is effort, extra effort required for them. But these exercises were done before the COVID pandemic hit us all. And so we use the World Food Program and the U UNESCO projections predictions to simulate six, six different scenarios. In three of them, we increase the percentage of poor and vulnerable people who are deprived in nutrition by 10, 25, and 50%. And in another three, we add to that a scenario in which half of primary school-aged children who are, not, who are attending school leave school. When we do that, we find that in the most modest scenario of a 10% increase in undernutrition among people who are not previously undernourished but are poor or vulnerable, it's 3.1 years. And it goes up to 9.9 .9 years. So that's a very sobering situation. And it's, it's one that could leave us feeling discouraged and daunted. So I want to end on a final observation. I said that Sierra Leone was the fastest country out of 75 countries and 5 billion people to reduce MPI. And it did so from 2013 to 2017. Those were the very same years when the Ebola pandemic tragically hit Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone reduced all 10 indicators of its MPI. It reduced poverty in 12 of its 14 regions it had the fastest reduction of children's MPI globally across our countries. Emergency responses to terrible situations must be done at galloping speed and human error as well as tragedy seem inev inevitable. But Sierra Leone shows us that even in these very difficult circumstances, uh, not a step, but a, a giant step forward was possible. And so that illustrates the possibility that even in these very difficult times, it is indeed possible to build back better, to build stronger. Um, any single story of success will seem tenuous and improbable, and all the more so given the realities we're struggling with at the moment. But the hope for us in releasing the global MPI is that you, people who are on the call and others will read about it and will use this information um, to fight and change the different policies with your energy, your imagination and creativity and your sheer hard work. Um, and the hope is that we will know that it is possible to make a historic inflection point. As I said, I've only scraped the surface of the materials that are in this report. And I do hope that readers will go beyond these to read the other sections. And also perhaps, particularly for the geeks, but for others to look online at the country briefings, the interactive data visualization tools, the data tables and methodological notes. I thank you very, very much. And I look forward most of all to the interchange and the questions and the reflections that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sabina, for the presentation and for trying to compress into just a few minutes another year's intense work with many, many people in the network of the countries that you have worked with. Now, it is in the nature of these live events that sometimes things don't quite work out as we hope, and it was going to be my pleasure to introduce His Excellency Mr. Manan, the Minister of Planning of Bangladesh. Unfortunately, the connection seems to not have worked. So, Sabina, since you have looked so closely and since we together in the development field have learned so often great insights from Bangladesh's own strategies and choices that it has made, would you perhaps just um, share one or two quick insights from the Bangladesh story of addressing poverty, multidimensional poverty, that can be a placeholder? And I'm sure that we will post the, uh, the statement from Minister Manan on the Human Development Report website, as we will also post the statement of His Excellency 
Prince Clem Ekanade Agba, the Minister of State, Budget and National Planning of the Federal Republic of Nigeria at this virtual launch. His Excellency could not join us today, but has submitted his address on multidimensional poverty. And this will also be available on the website of the Human Development Report Office um, of UNDP. So um, Sabina, just in a short set of nuggets, perhaps some insights that you know uh, Minister Manan would also have shared with us today. Thank you so much. Um... Oh. Now, this is, this is the surprise appearance, Minister. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, you have just saved Sabina in an unscheduled moment, and I'm delighted to welcome you. So straight over to you, and uh, you have the floor. Welcome honored to this to event. I'm honored. I'm honored to be with you this evening. Thank you. So please go ahead. Your timing is perfect. Uh, just in time, the floor is yours. We have begun. Sabina just made the presentation on the MPI overall for the year 2020. And I was just saying that in your absence, I wanted her to speak to a couple of the insights from what so often we have learned from Bangladesh over the years in how to address multidimensional poverty. But since you are here live, straight over to you. The world is listening to you. Thank you. I have a written text given by my Ministry, so I'll read that first. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be present in this important event this evening. I would like to convey our thanks to Dr. Sabina Alkire. I hope I'm right. Alkire, how do I say that? Alkire, okay. Director, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiatives and UNDP, particularly the administrator and other gentlemen and ladies for organizing this event. The COVID-19 crisis has triggered a global economic crisis with lockdown measures to control the spread of the virus, resulting in the shutdown of economic activities and widespread job loss. UNDP measures global human development, a combination of education, health, and living standards could fall this year for the first time since 1990. UNICEF projections show that in South Asia, over the coming six months, as many as 120 million more children could be pushed into poverty and food insecurity joining some 240 million children already classified as poor. In Bangladesh, the threat of income loss is acute. Bangladesh is already highly vulnerable to other covariate shocks. For example, Cyclone Ampan only recently destroyed the homes of around 500,000 people. Further compounding the crisis, recent estimates say that in Bangladesh, some 35 million people will emerge as new poor due to the COVID-19. Policy relevance of multinational, multidimensional poverty index, MPI and CMPI for Bangladesh in the context of COVID-19. First, while Bangladesh as a middle income economy has embarked on a new chapter in its development with expectations of continued strong economic growth, the country has been facing new challenges of reform and transition. We realized that a change of focus in the light in the fight against poverty was necessary to have a comprehensive view of poverty and identify its causes in the national context. Second, the current income poverty measurement was not proving adequate for guiding the public policy interventions, especially with regard to social policy. It becomes crucial to look beyond traditional methods of measuring poverty based on income or consumption levels and adopt an approach to seek the multidimensional phase of poverty. Third, several MPA, MPI indicators may serve as a key predictor of population at risk during the COVID-19 pandemic and can be used to adopt policy measures to mitigate COVID-related shocks. Indicators such as stunting, vaccination, health, child labor, child labor would help us to under, understand the magnitude of both direct and indirect results of COVID-19 on the people and children at risk, and to act to counter the knock-on effects of the pandemic urgently. I would like to mention that the government of Bangladesh has announced about seven, about seven billion US dollars stimulus package for the business and the people at large who need it most. Social protection allocation has been increased to about 3% of the GDP. The government has announced special schemes for all poor, elderly, widow, and destitute women and persons with disabilities. Even with limited access to 
to services during lockdowns than parents' fear of infection. The support from UNICEF, the government has, with support from UNICEF, the government has continued the very important immunization program and delivered new supplies of therapeutic milk to health centers across the country. The MPI and CMPI indicators can provide us additional information about women, men, and children who fall out to multinational poverty due to COVID-19 related shocks and would allow the government to increase investment and expand coverage to safeguard them. The government is currently working to develop the eighth five-year plan for 2020 to 2025 period. And we are putting efforts to combine income, consumption, poverty, and multidimensional approach of poverty together and to come up with a robust poverty analysis for five-year plan, including a COVID-19 angle in it. I would like to thank the UNICEF, UNDP, and OPHI for their support to develop the measurement. Sustainable Development Goals SDG is called to eradicate poverty in all its forms everywhere. But the roadmap to poverty eradication has been changed by the pandemic. The pandemic has shown us a new world where the status quo no longer exists and forced us to reconsider almost every aspect of how we live. The MPI would help us to find the answer, providing immensely valuable information for all those seeking to understand what poverty looks like for a particular place or for a particular group of people, and for those working on the policies to help people escape falling into poverty now and into the future. Finally, I wish to draw your attention to some of the features regarding Bangladesh's MPI using 2019 Multiple Indicator Cluster Survey, MICS. By that survey, now 24.6% of people are multidimensionally poor, fewer than in India in 2015-16, which had 27.9% in poverty. Two countries in South Asia, our neighbors, Sri Lanka and Maldives, have lower MPI than Bangladesh. Bangladesh had the fastest relative poverty reduction in South Asia, reducing its initial MPI of 0.175% by 42% in five years to 0.101%. In terms of equity between subnational regions, Bangladesh was one of the 16 countries where the poorest regions was less than twice MPI of the least poor region. And inequality between regions reduced into, in 2019. Bangladesh is one of the 20 countries that significantly reduced deprivation among the poor in all 10 indicators. Bangladesh is one of the 15 countries that reduced MPI over twice as fast as 1.90 dollars per day monetary poverty. Bangladesh has also significant reductions by different poverty lines. It reduced severe poverty and vulnerability. Bangladesh also nearly halved, nearly halved a newly released measure of, dist of destitution, which covers troubling deprivation like severe malnutrition, open defecation, or household lacking a person who has completed more than one year of schooling showing that the poverty reduction is pervasive and inclusive of persons living in very fragile conditions. I thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Excellency. And uh, I should also say thank you so much for finding a moment to join us when really the situation that you are currently facing both in the Ministry of Planning, but as a country with the floods is another one of those extraordinary moments. And our hearts go out to you and, and the people of Bangladesh. I have seen the images uh, almost a third of the country underwater, um, you know, millions affected. This is a decadal flood and, and um, we very much hope that in the coming days um, it will not get worse. But thank you so much for being able to share with us um, the experience of Bangladesh, its relevance in terms of multidimensional poverty and also how Bangladesh sees itself moving forward. It is now my pleasure to turn to Isabel Sanmalo, the former Vice President of Panama. And um, to you, Isabel, if I may turn with the question of um, data is always compelling and uh, the story it can tell is also compelling. But as somebody who has stood in the center of a political arena, um, politics can get in the way of effective action. We know that poverty reduction, um, eradicating poverty 
comes down to choices that governments make, societies make, the level of tolerance or commitment that they show. What can you offer us as advice, having been in that role in government, of how a multidimensional poverty index, the analysis, can help to shape thinking, influence politics and choices made? Isabel, over to you. Thank you so much, Hakim, and, and thank you for the invitation to join this uh, a panel on, on such an important uh, event of launching this 10th uh, year multidimensional report. And I would like, before I answer that very important question, to express my deep appreciation to, to Sabina, Ofi, and, and UNDP, because when Panama prepared our national uh, MPI, the advice, the support, the constant accompaniment of both institutions was very, very important, assuring us that we were on the right track. So thank you for that. And as you have pointed in your question, yes, politics can get in the way. And there are a few lessons that I'd like to, to share. And, and the, the number one is that at the end, governments and policymakers always wish the best for the people, wish the best for the countries. But resources are very limited. The resources are never enough. And the tool that the MPI represents in terms of choices, it's amazing. In the case of Panama, for example, because our process was a very participatory process and we reach out to communities, we found out that the issue of rural roads, which is not one of the 10 indicators, was central to Panama's definition of our own MPI. So that gave us clear information that led us to make some shifts and changes on our budget and to prioritize those type of investments because those would have a clear impact on reducing MPI. So there are lessons, clear lessons, and there are uh, strategies that can be uh, um, respond to MPI. The second thing that I'd like to share is the importance of leadership. In the construction of the MPI and in using that MPI for uh, policy formulation uh, at the highest level. It's, it's a technical process but it's a technical process that needs that political support because it's a technical process that should transform how a country decides on investment, how a country fights poverty, how, how a country addresses policies to fight poverty. So this process needs to happen at the technical level, but with the clear guidance and support from the highest level. And the, and the last, um, um, uh, thing that I'd like to mention is that countries that do not have NPI, you have a clear advantage with this global NPI that is already uh, giving you some information. So I encourage you to utilize that for policy making uh, and then eventually when possible to really work on national NPIs because the information that it produces is central to policy formulation. Thank you, Akim, over to you. Very clear uh, and to the point, Isabel, thank you. As you are following this discussion, please be aware that there is actually a question and answer tab uh, on the Zoom platform. And the same is true, I think, for the, the YouTube platform. So please do send in questions. I will read a couple out now just to weave them in also into the next responses as I turn in a moment to Olivier de Schutter to, to address us. So let me briefly mention a couple. Um, one from Bangladesh um, that is uh, basically asking, you know, what are the specific policy and programming measures that we can derive from, from the evidence and, and also apply in countries like Bangladesh to ensure the protection of the vulnerable and, and allow an economic, a sustainable pathway to, to emerge. From Germany, a question about how is well-being um, considered or defined in the different dimensions of poverty. And I think, uh, Olivier, that is perhaps a, a very relevant question to you, as might be the next one, which is um, coming from Dubai. What uh, or why doesn't the MPI take into account the digital divide? Um, and Sabina, maybe later on, you might want to respond to that also. And then from India, uh, a comment that COVID-19 is a massive disruption and particularly pointing out that reverse migration, which is unprecedented of about three and a half million people in the state of Bihar alone, has put huge pressure on the existing inadequate poverty alleviation programs. Um, how are we going to factor in this massive man-made policy blunder um, in the MPI also these realities? So, uh, Olivier, it is my great pleasure to um, um, hand the floor to you as the uh, UN 
Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Everything that this index and that this discussion refers to is part of your daily work and, and, uh, and passion also. So with that, I give the floor to Olivier de Schutter. Thank you. Well, many thanks, uh, Achim, for these very kind words and congratulations, of course, to uh, Sabina Kayer for the um, fantastic um, um, tenth uh, edition of the Global Multi-Dimensional multi Poverty Index. Um, I, I think it's really important that we activists working on the issue of extreme poverty use this index in our work. And I'd like to say that this is true for two reasons. First, because we usually see um, the lack of income as explaining poor health and nutrition, poor education, uh, poor standard of living. But actually what the multidimensional poverty index shows is that it can also be the opposite. In other terms, having poor access to education, to health, to housing uh, may mean that income opportunities are lesser. And so to break this vicious cycle, we need to have this multidimensional approach to, to poverty. And secondly, of course, GDP growth is not um, you know, the magic bullet we once thought it should be. It shall only serve human development if combined with um, an anti-poverty strategy that allows growth to be captured by the people at the bottom of the income earners, and if it serves to finance public services to the population in areas such as healthcare, education, and housing. My own role as Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights shall be to move beyond that, however, to emphasize the fact that if we um, look at political disempowerment, anti-poor discrimination, we understand better how services for the poor are often poor services. And we can focus on the hidden dimensions of poverty, such as the, the anguish people feel, the disempowerment they experience, the lack of recognition of their contributions, and the abuse, institutional social abuse they are subjected to. And I think this is really important, this human rights angle for three reasons. And I, I close with this very simply. First, um, it allows people that are in poverty to be connected with the empowering potential of human rights. In other terms, to experience themselves, not simply as victims and as victims of deprivation, but also as um, entitled to certain um, services and goods uh, from the government, um, which allows them to overcome this, this shame and this sense of powerlessness that otherwise they experience. It rebalances relationships, if you wish, between service providers, governments on the one hand, and people in poverty on the other hand. Secondly, it is essential to um, allow us to also overcome the challenges linked to the qualitative dimensions of um, the multi-dimensional um, uh, factor of, of poverty. For example, Mauritania increased the years of schooling. Liberia improved the rates of school attendance. But what do we know about whether pupils in schools in Liberia or Mauritania are actually learning? And is the educational process effective in, um, in allowing them to acquire um, these uh, capacities? And thirdly, um, human rights are really important because they oblige us to also consider the question of inequality. Inequality as a source of disempowerment. Even if um, people move out from extreme poverty measured in a multi-dimensional perspective, they still may feel disempowered if they are treated as unequals and if they remain at the bottom of the social ladder and if we don't tackle inequalities more seriously. And I know that the UNDP has done superb, indeed vital work on these issues. And so I'm very delighted that we shall be able to continue to work together on these themes. Many thanks again. Thank you, Olivier, and thank you for your comments also. I think one of the things that marks, in a sense, a, a principal approach that UNDP has embraced and, and embodied to some extent over time is that um, people are at the center. So trying to understand human well-being definitely has to transcend the, the narrow confines of, of measurement, whether it is uh, poverty uh, through income levels or otherwise. But 
I just want to ask you for one more comment because we actually have a very interesting audience following us with some very um, searching questions. And one that just came in strikes me as relevant to what you have just spoken to. Nonzo Obikili writes that there has been a significant number of discussions on the difficulty with measuring poverty based on a poverty level as opposed to a more distributional approach incorporating inequality. And Olivier, in your comments just now, you straddle the human rights, the basic rights approach. You um, touched on the issues of inequality also. And um, the question that is asked by, by Nonzo is, do you or any of the panelists think that there are significant merits to the distributional approach um, or does that risk leaving the extreme poor, those at the bottom of the distribution behind, if the focus switches to inequality? I, is there a trade-off? Can it broaden the lens? Or how do we bring these two dimensions together? Do you want to briefly comment on that? Well, I, I think the two are vital and they are not a substitute for one another. Um, it is extremely um, striking when you ask people in poverty how they experience their situation that the answers will be quite similar, even though they may live in very different situations in Norway and Uganda. Of course, being poor is very different, but the language they use, the vocabulary they use to describe the stress they experience, the anguish they feel, the sense of um, not being able to change their condition and their um, sense that they are going to transmit their powerlessness and deprivation to their children, experiencing the same intergenerational transmission of poverty. In some countries, um, it takes uh, um, uh, five, six generations to overcome uh, poverty in an intergenerational perspective. And all these experiences are common. And so I think um, poverty can also be understood as relative to the situation one is in in a particular society. It's not simply a matter of deprivation, uh, either um, uh, low income or even uh, deprivation in, in access to basic uh, services and goods, such as in the areas of health, nutrition, uh, education, or housing. And so I, I do think the two measures should be used as complementary. And again, neither is a substitute for the other. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you so much also for being part of the discussion today and for the vital work that, that you do as uh, our UN Special Rapporteur. I am now turning to um, <clears throat> Theodora swift Collar, who is the Senior Technical Advisor, interesting enough, for equity, so very appropriate, at the World Health Organization. And before I give you the floor, Theodora, let me read out two more questions. You may pick up on one or more elements of the ones that I have read out. One is from a colleague in <clears throat> UNICEF who writes that in nearly a third of the countries studied, either there was no reduction in multidimensional poverty for children, or the MPI value fell more slowly for children than for adults. It's in fact echoing something that even transcends sort of um, the notion of households. The Human Development Report 2019 uh, detected that within households, there can even be differentiation amongst children in terms of um, how poverty and inequality affects them. So perhaps no surprise to those who have looked at household data, but certainly something to focus on. And then another question on um, the MPI is a deprivation model. I'm quoting here that tracks the lack of, in inverted commas, is there data available on indicators of resilience, uh, such as social cohesion, religious belief, proximity to support networks? If so, how do these protective measures correlate with the likelihood of lifting out of multidimensional poverty or dropping back into poverty in times of crisis. So, um, Theodora, just a, a few more curveballs for you, but also please, um, obviously, um, very much the focus on what you had prepared. So, please, over to you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here with you all. So, I, I uh, was going to discuss. The, the fact that nearly 85% of the world's multidimensionally poor live in rural areas. And I was gonna explore this a bit more from the health perspective. Uh, later, I'll, I'll come back to these uh, points that were just raised. Um, so I wanna first start by talking a bit more about the health of the rural poor. Um, and I want to expand on 
uh, the drivers uh, first of health inequities in rural areas. And, and uh, in many countries, they're due to weaker health systems, as well as adverse social and environmental determinants of health experienced by the rural poor. And uh, the MPI, uh, as, as you all know, covers the child mortality and nutrition, uh, as well as key determinants such as water and sanitation and cooking fuel. This year's report also looked at immunization. In many countries, rural and poor populations typically experience inequities in all of these. There are other important inequities, health inequities, um, that I that uh, too many to list here, but I just like to name a few. Um, maternal mortality, maternal mortality can be higher in women living in rural areas and among poor communities. Neglected tropical diseases principally impact the rural poor. Zoonoses, uh, occupational health issues, workers in agriculture run twice the risk of dying on the job compared with workers in other sectors. And for non-communicable diseases in many countries, the rural poor can experience significant challenges in accessing timely and appropriate health services. So what is WHO doing in the face of these uh, health inequities? Um, well, we have a, a, a currently now underway uh, a marker that looks at mainstreaming equity across of all of our, all of our programming uh, uh, programmatic responses for different health topics. We also have work uh, to support the recruitment and retention of health workers in rural areas. Uh, a tool called Access Mod uh, is exploring how physical accessibility to health facilities, heat, the health equity assessment toolkit uh, really looks at how to support countries in doing health inequality monitoring to look at the situation experienced by the rural poor. Innovate uh, aims uh, to support national authorities in reviewing national health programs to close coverage gaps and really leave no one behind. Uh, we also have methods to conduct barriers assessments to understand why certain subpopulations can't uh, be accessing the, the services and the drivers behind those barriers. Um, so I think we're doing a lot, but we have an overarching feeling that it's not enough. Um, and and at, at the 10 year, you know, we 10 years left for the SDGs. Now, uh, as an, in an international development community and across the UN, we really need to scale up our, our overarching approach to rural poverty, uh, given, given the fact that almost 85% of the multidimensional poor live in rural areas. And so, um, what we now have underway uh, together with with FAO and through the umbrella of the new interagency inequalities task team is uh, a process to set in motion the planning of uh, some very concrete, precise cross UN family uh, deliverables and activities over the next couple of years that will aim to move towards a more coordinated comprehensive and scaled up approach to tackling rural poverty. Um, not taking it you know, in an agency specific way, but really aiming towards uh, looking at a new rural development paradigm that uh, aims to tackle rural poverty and decrease inequities in access to uh, I, in rural areas. So just to-, to We have to step in because time's running out, but please, if oh. you can just conclude not to stop you. Yes, uh, sure. Right. Just to- <laughs> to conclude on uh, using MPI data in moving forward um, with it, this new interagency initiative, we definitely plan to use MPI data because in areas like health, for example, we see how health deprivations are influenced by and influence um, deprivations in other sectoral domains. And so the MPI really sets a, a useful framework for looking at integrated comprehensive rural planning rural poverty reduction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dido, and thank you for joining us, um, especially at this time when everyone in the WHO is in 24-7 mode. So very good to have you with us. Thank you. Um, colleagues, it's uh, my great pleasure now to invite Dean Jolliffe um, as uh, uh, the lead economist on the Development Data Group of the World Bank, he is extremely familiar with both um, the work of the World Bank, the debates within the World Bank, and the debates within the larger poverty community on how we measure, how we use indexes, and how, in particular, we guide um, the discussion about informed policy choices. So, Dean, without any further delay, 
Um, you have the floor and thank you very much for joining us today. Great, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to read on this, uh, to read the report and to comment on it. Um, I'll make a few comments kind of around the technical aspects of the work, but would first just like to congratulate the UNDP and OFI on producing a really useful and interesting um, report. As you've noticed, noted, my background is on the uh, sort of more on the measurement side of this. And I'd first just like to comment that I found the discussion of the, um, the comparisons with the um, consumption-based measure of poverty based on the $1.90 line to be really balanced and to hit really the sort of key message that um, we shouldn't view these as competitors, but they really are sending complementary uh, signal. And as Olivier noted, it's um, it's less about which one is right. It's not about which one is right or wrong, but it's about the policy prescriptions that we would think uh, are required to address both, particularly when they co-move and when they move in the same direction and when they start sending different signals, how one thinks about the policy would, would differ in those contexts. Um, I'll also note uh, a, a different issue that I found really pretty fascinating in the report was they've taken this brave step forward in, um, in trying to forecast MPI. And that's, that's very risky because we don't know what the future holds as, as uh, particularly in the world that we live in today. We know that thinking about how and what things will look like in 2030 is, is a high risk um, uh, venture, but it's incredibly important. And, and it's what policymakers need advice on. Um, I think the way that the report has addressed this is, is sensible. They've looked at um, past performance and are essentially extrapolating that out in the future. And I think uh, a fair amount can be learned from that. I suppose I'd propose that in giving um, public discussions or public presentations of the forecast work, that maybe the presenters give just a little bit of guidance to the audience in how to interpret um, some of the findings in the forecast work. So in particular, in those cases where we don't seem to be on path that Certainly, it means business as usual or business that has occurred in the past um, will not get us to, to the goal is an easy sort of message to convey. Um, and then I'll just note that uh, the forecast work really sort of opens up an important door, I think, for in particular the OFI team to think um, about expanding on some of the technical details, not for a report like this, but for one of their methodological notes where they could explore um, potentially sort of different aspects of thinking about forecasting where um, they were to try to potentially integrate in information about um, demographic change, which we probably have fairly uh, uh, credible predictions on that or GDP growth rates where one has some sense of um, uh, the potential path forward and looking at how MPI co-varies with that in a way that might help um, forecasting. Um, I suspect they've done some of that work, but it would be great to see some of that written up and maybe on that note, I'll just make one final comment. I know we're pressed for time, um, but I do think it's worthwhile just taking a moment to really um, appreciate that these reports um, are meant to be written in a way that they're easy to read and to understand. And, and this report succeeds in that dimension. It's very digestible, conveys a lot of useful information, um, but it's also important to recognize that it reflects a series of a lot of complex technical work you know, all the way from sampling to questionnaire design to field work at data collection to the analytical work. And um, the ability to assess really the, the quality of the report, uh, uh, like what we're reading today, rests on our ability to assess the quality of the foundation uh, upon which this report uh, rests. And the way that, um, um, that works very well for this report is that OFI has a methodological note uh, series that documents um, uh, across many different dimensions, a large array of the technical uh, assumptions underpinning this work. Now, I recognize that very few people read these documents, but we shouldn't get lost in this notion that downloads uh, are a function, you know, are a good measure for importance of work. I think the fact that this material exists for advisors to policymakers, technical advisors to policymakers to read, to comment on and to assess the credibility is really critical. And I think, I suppose I'm saying this because I think it's sometimes um, undervalued. And I think it's really wonderful that UNDP and OFI clearly place a high value on getting these technical details out. Um, I'll also note that it's, it's a vibrant way of 
fostering discussion and dialogue and critiques of the methods. And I think it's a way for all of us to do a better job in the future of moving forward on, on measurement. And maybe on that last point, I'll just note that um, the one area where I think um, MPI, I yeah, think the, the future for it. OK, <laughs> all right. I'll just make this suggestion that um, in many cases, we're informed um, that the work is rigorous and uh, can guarantee sort of uh, harmonized work. And I'll just say those sort of words will uh, are more useful when they're supported by experiments in the field that validate some of the assertions going on. That stuff is costly, but I think it's super important behind um, work like this, where we're trying to do very difficult work of harmonizing different measures of MPI over time to think about change over time. That's a more difficult task than has been asked in the past of MPI, but it's really important to sort of lay that groundwork. And, um, and so I'd just like to encourage the further development of that methodological note series and the support for that. So thanks very much. Incredibly useful and um, and rewarding report to read. Thank you. Dean, thank you. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> indeed, there is a community of practice and thinking that very much straddles the institutions, the countries, uh, universities, academics. And I think the MPI has become one of those networks in which we can all, I think, contribute, but also benefit. Now, time is going to run out very quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out a few more questions because there is um, just a wonderful array of questions here that um, basically can inform also follow-up discussions. And <clears throat> then I will turn to our panelists for a quick one minute, um, picking out an aspect or a message to place. And uh, I'll ask Sabina last to perhaps pick up a couple of comments also on, on uh, MPI uh, specific. So one question from a journalist um, in Spain. Um, I would like um, the panelist or Sabina Akira to go in depth uh, in the Sierra Leone case. Uh, Sierra Leone case. What explains that the country managed to reduce poverty during the Ebola crisis? Can any lessons from Sierra Leone be used now in the COVID-19 recovery, also in rich countries, as both of them are affected? Um, another question, perhaps to Isabel <clears throat> and to Minister Manan. What advice would you provide to those trying to work with governments to develop a national multidimensional poverty index? And there are many now in, in the works and have been prepared. So there are good lessons that have been learned. And how you can ensure that there is high level political ownership and support. From Rashid Reza, we have uh, the comment that in some instances, the number of years of schooling may not necessarily be a reflection of the quality of education. How does the MPI reconcile inferences obtained from years of schooling versus quality of education? Clearly an issue that you know, bedevils us all in development uh, surveys and statistics. And from our colleagues in UNDP Lao, uh, PDR, we have a question on governance um, to you, Olivier. Governance is a critical factor in reducing multidimensional poverty, especially local governance, as a majority of people experiencing multidimensional poverty live in rural areas. Any specific strategy that the Special Rapporteur can share as part of his mandate in influencing national governments to improve governance to tackle poverty? And a question on gender also, can the MPI capture gender and sex inequalities in MPI? I'm concerned that girls will continue to be largely invisible and left behind. And I think there will be good questions to, or good, a good answer to, to some of those questions. So um, if I may begin with His Excellency Minister Manan, um, we have to unfortunately do it in one minute segments. So um, a kind of telegraphic, uh, pick the lowest hanging fruit or the most interesting aspect. Over to you, Minister Manan. Thank you very much. Well, the way I would like to say that in 1971, when we became independent, our population was 70 million and we were 80% poor. 50 years down the road in this year, our population is 160 million and we are just about 20% poor. That, we take pride in that. It's been a long, long journey, but very successful. Unfortunately, the recent COVID has pushed us a little off track. The number of poor have again gone up. It's about 30% now. Uh, with support from international community and our own work, we hope that we can beat it back and hoping that COVID will bend in much sooner than some people say, uh, we would pick up again and uh, with a multidimensional or singular approach, combination of both, the approach that we have been following over the years and also learning from UNDP and others with friends from abroad, would like to attack the issue again. And we hope that remaining 20%, which remain, uh, should come down by about 10% in the next five years time. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Minister, and um, very clear response. Um, Isabel, may I turn to you for uh, the Glorious Minute? The Glorious Minute, which is difficult, Akim, because so many important things have been said. I'll, I'll try to be brief. First of all, there has been a, a, enough mention to COVID-19 and what this can represent. And I think that to give an example of, of measurements, we have all discovered how important connectivity is within COVID-19 and how that has allowed many people to continue working or continue school. In the case of Panama and other Latin American countries, Panama, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic, internet coverage was incorporated as one of the measurements in our national MPIs. At the time, it was kind of questioned because it definitely could not have the same weight as health or as education, but it has proven to be central. I'll also like to mention that we are 10 years before 2030. So it's been mentioned very much what this represents to show if we have advances towards SDGs or if we don't. Also, the report shows that it is possible to have multidimensional poverty in 10 years. So just imagine what we can do in 10 years from 2020 to 2030 when we're supposed to reach the sustainable development goals if we are able to really monitor our advances through MPI. And last to finish, you mentioned there was a question on how can, uh, uh, when countries are trying to build their national NPI had to get political support. This is not a tool to measure a government. This is a tool to support a country's advancement. So it is important to build that trust and, and to build that um, uh, um, relaxed atmosphere in terms of a government because it is to be understood as a tool to measure the advancement of a country. And that is, I would think, very, very important. Thank very, you very much. Very wise words, Isabel. Um, thank you very much. Let me quickly move to Theodora. Um, the one minute response, please. Then Dean, then Olivier, and then Sabina. We'll just stretch over for five minutes because um, I think the number of participants has still been going up. So we have, we have um, uh, good energy. Okay, uh, I'm going to actually cover the governance question that was asked and uh, really making the, the, the link with governance for tackling inequities and how that can contribute to poverty reduction. Um, and just, of course, using a, a, an example from the health sector, I think that in the context now of thinking through economic recovery and stimulus plans, um, and again, using the example of the rural poor, a we need governance for strengthening rural health systems uh, to reduce the inequities experienced by the rural populations. And for example, in globally, there's an anticipated shortage of 18 million health workers by 2030 to achieve universal health coverage. Shortages are most prominent in rural and remote areas, of course, leaving the, the poorest subpopulations without access to essential services. So governance to invest in the health and social workforce uh, has multiplier effects and it will bring more inclusive economic growth and contribute to poverty reduction, including in rural areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Theodora. Dean, uh, a last shot. Sure, so I, I'll, I'll take a crack at the question about the uh, quality of education or quality of really of any of these dimensions. And uh, I'll just make a pitch in, in support of the this global MPI measure. And, and I think if we think about that global MPI measure, the, the critical attribute of that is that we need to be able to make comparable comparisons across countries. So it's meant to give us portrayals of how countries are performing relative to other countries or to other regions. It's a really important tool, but it's not meant to solve all problems. And, and I think what's really nice about the work that, um, that uh, is done with the MPI is that there's this recognition that there's both a global MPI and a national MPI. And that national MPI is the tool to really drill down to the specifics of the country details. And so if quality of education is a key attribute and you have good data on that, then embed that or integrate it into that particular national, that country's national MPI. Don't ask the global MPI to carry that because that data just won't exist in a way that's comparable across countries. And so it's just really that recognition that this fight against poverty, it's, it's a very hard, complex fight and we need many different tools. And this is gonna be one very important tool in our toolkit. Thank you so much. And, and perhaps one of the things that might 
also add a dimension of possibility is the, the, the digital universe that is opening up uh, artificial intelligence and we may be able to overcome some of the manually collected empirical data in future with um, a more accurate interpretation of, of data. So that's perhaps an interesting issue as well. Uh, Olivier, um, over to you for any last comments or thoughts or provocations. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I like uh, very much the question that comes from our colleague from UNDP in, in Laos. I, I, I think it's really important to uh, capture better the potential of uh, people managing their own resources at the local level to avoid both exclusion by market mechanisms and privatization, but also political exclusion by everything being done from above by the state. And I think that was at the heart, of course, of the work of Elino Ostrom on the commons. Um, we now have studies that show that equality, um, because it co creates uh, social capital, because it creates trust, because it allows people to work cooperatively with one another, equality is key in order to have those local governance systems function. And I think in, in many areas related particularly to health, to education, um, to agricultural assets, allowing uh, farmers to produce, uh, to access to, to, to services and goods at the local level, um, governance by, by the people is important. More broadly, I would say, and this is my answer to the question of quality, that unless people in poverty participate in governing the systems, their needs will be systematically neglected. And yes, governments will want to tick the boxes and will want to increase the number of years during which kids are educated, for example, but there will be no one to complain if the quality of the education is, is, is failing, if, uh, if the, the, the kids actually are not learning. And so if we want to address this question beyond quantity of the qualitative measure of um, multidimensional poverty, we need to strengthen participatory rights of people in poverty. Thank you so much, Olivier, and, and very clear. Sabina, um, to you for um, obviously an impossible task. So just pick the two or three things that you want to leave with our audience as um, the threads for further conversation engagement with us. Very good. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's a rich feast to pick from. Um, on the data, I agree that there are so many limitations, but it may be possible in the next years to build a moderate MPI that would include, for example, internet access or obesity and go up um, and so be relevant, for example, in Latin America or Europe and Central Asia or the Arab states where the MPI as currently built is not. But that will be data constrained, yet I want to thank um, DHS and Mix for their tremendous work in doing these data that can be disaggregated. We rely on them, we can't change the system but we thank them for their work. On gender and on children, those are important themes and we hope next year to be able to bring out more work on that. For example, only two countries cut child MPI by half, India and Nicaragua. Um, and as this, somebody wrote, one third of countries did not reduce child MPI, which is really a troubling fact. Then we will analyze that further. In terms of women and gender, we are able to break down some of the indicators, for example, years of schooling or child school attendance or nutrition by gender. And for example, next year, hopefully see to what extent are MPI poor households lacking an educated woman. So those are the kind of limited, but perhaps insightful add-on studies we can do. I'll close with one point that builds on what Dean suggested and thanks to Dean for all his comments. And to all of you, there are papers and methodological notes galore if you want to go to sleep tonight without any problem. Um, lots of material to read. In terms of the 18 countries that I said are off track by all three models, we do in the background, we, robust, we stress that test. Each country was predicted based on its own prior trajectory. But if 18 countries went not to a high trajectory, but simply to the median trajectory of poverty reduction, 15 out of the 18 would cut their MPI by half. So they are off, but they're off and it's feasible perhaps to turn the tide even there. So this is the work that we can do. We are numbers people. We can't do the work that you and the audience can do of actually building the change, but we can at least show what other countries have done and hope that that imagination catches. Thank you. 
Sabina, thank you very much. And to all our panelists, thank you for your ability and willingness to join us today to work in this tight format, but also to still bring substance and, and perspective to an issue that still affects, if you take the MPI, 1.3 billion people amongst us. And let me say one thing, in all the imperfection of data collection and the, the, the lack of precision and sometimes also the, the great danger that averages and aggregated data hide the reality, the absolute reality of poverty, of deprivation, of discrimination. One of the reasons why collecting information is so vital is that it not only informs our decision making, it also makes it more difficult to simply um, have a veneer of invisibility on what is truly an indictment of a world that is richer than ever in terms of economic history, and yet 1.3 billion people are categorized as living in a multidimensionally poor reality. That visibility is, first of all, one that tries to counter the temptation that those who are wealthier, yes, they can live on the other side of town. They don't have to stare at the reality of slums. They don't have to face the daily reality of living from hand to mouth. And uh, therefore we do as the United Nations, uh, as OFI, as the World Bank and many others at the national level, Minister Manan and National Planning Ministry, we must invest in our ability to make visible what otherwise remains invisible and therefore ignorable. And that is a deep commitment that I think we always must bring to both understanding the power of data information and therefore informing a public discourse in a country, in a community globally but also the limitations of data. And I think we continue to work and that's why we're so proud to have our partnership um, with OFI, with the World Inequality Database in Paris and many others who are part of the networks that allow us to better understand data. But ultimately, and I end with that for UNDP, there is also a more than 30 year journey of trying to understand what Amatya Sen at the time wove into the DNA also of UNDP's thinking, I believe about development and that is that um, we need to look at people not as um, we need to look at people as agents, not as patients. This is the the quotation that I I want to leave you with, because at the end of the day, this sort of information also empowers those who are not partaking in the growth of GDP per capita economy, who are not partaking perhaps in the formal sector of employment, to actually have the power to organize to inform themselves and to provide solutions and inputs into the national policy choices that are so central to tackling extreme poverty, poverty inequality. With these remarks, thank you to all of you. Thank you to Sabina and Ofi, to the partnership, to the many who contribute to this visibility of what is an indictment of development, but also let us learn the lessons where development has succeeded because the right policy choices were made because society said we are not going to tolerate this and the stories abound on both ends of the equation. Thank you so much. I wish you all the best and my apologies to those whose questions we could not or comments quote here, but you've seen them on the Q&A function and uh, the discussion continues. More importantly, the battle to eradicate poverty must accelerate. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.